Hi, I'm Dr. Christy Sutton, and today we're going to be talking about the gut and the microbiome, but we're also going to be talking about the brain and how it actually affects the gut and vice versa, because it's all connected. So like I said, I'm Dr. Christy Sutton, and today we're going to be talking about it all starts in the brain, gut, both. We're going to talk about the environmental and genetic considerations. And so this is for educational purposes only. This is not intended to diagnose, treat, or prevent disease. So first, we're going to kind of take a little reminder, and I, th I think it's helpful to um, learn a little bit about the digestive system and make sure you review that before we dive into the genes and labs and kind of the nitty gritty science. So first let's talk about just some of the um, nuances of the gut and how the microbiome affects the gut and how the gut is involved in absorption of nutrients. And so of course we know, you know, we eat the food and then it goes down into the stomach and in the stomach, that's where hydrochloric acid is released. And then the hydrochloric acid um, allows the protein to be broken down. So like if somebody doesn't have enough hydrochloric acid, then they are going to often feel like the food just sits in their stomach, especially like if they eat a high protein food, like a red meat type food, they're going to really feel like it's just sitting there in their stomach and they can't digest it. Um, that's a sign of hypochlorhydria. So, so the stomach makes, makes a hydrochloric acid. But of course, it needs the brain to tell it to do that. So it's really the brain and the vagus nerve that creates the, the ability of, for the pyloric cells in the stomach to make hydrochloric acid. So not only does the um, hydrochloric acid get made by the pyloric cells, but also the intrinsic factor is made by the pyloric cells. And the intrinsic factor is what ultimately is required for B12 absorption, which is why people that have low stomach acid or on acid reducing drugs, various issues with their stomach acid and pyloric cells develop low B12. So then, then the stomach acid, you know, once that food is kind of broken down, it goes, it's then secreted into the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. And um, once that food is secreted into the small intestine, that stimulates the really the acidity of that food stimulates bile to be, be released by the gallbladder. So the liver makes the bile, and then that bile is stored in the gallbladder. And then whenever the acidity and fat is introduced from the stomach into the small intestine, the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, that bile is released by the signal from the gut that fats and acidity is in the duodenum. Okay, so then also the pancreas will stimulate, um, will be stimulated to make and secrete the pancreatic enzymes like um, amylase for digesting sugars, carbohydrates, protease for digesting proteins, um, lipase for digesting fats and lipids. Um, cell well, uh, cellulase is not normally made by the pancreas, but cellulase does break down cellulose. Um, so certainly it makes these enzymes and then it gets secreted into the duodenum where it continues to break down everything. And all of this is being controlled by your nervous system. So if you're really stressed out, then your brain is not going to send the signal to basically create all of the bile and stimulate to be stimulated to create the pancreatic enzymes and be stimulated to create the peristalsis of the gut digestive system. And then um, you end up with food backing up, not digesting properly. Um, so once the food is in the duodenum, that's where the fat-soluble vitamins largely get digested and absorbed because you have that bile. So it's in the first part of the duodenum where the vitamin A, D, E, K, and minerals are absorbed. And then as you go down into the jejunum, which is the middle part of the small intestine, that's where you get the protein, carbohydrates, and then some of the vitamin and minerals as well. 
And then the very last part of the small intestine, the ileum, the part that it connects into the colon, that is where B12 is absorbed. So the B12 binds to the intrinsic factor in the stomach and in the intestines, and then it is not absorbed until the last foot of the small intestine. The other thing that's absorbed in the last foot of the small intestine is the bile. So if somebody is not secreting enough bile, then they'll often get constipated and that will create some gut dysbiotic issues. Um, in addition, and detoxification issues, um, and they'll, their stool will often be like light colored. They'll have difficulty, gassiness, um, digestive issues, with, especially with fat, um, digesting fats. If they're not secreting enough bile, they'll have upper right quadrant pain from the gallbladder pain um, whenever they eat fatty foods often. And then if they are not absorbing bile, then um, that's a whole nother issue. And that can either be because they have inflammation in the last foot of their small intestine and the ileum, or perhaps maybe um, they had that part removed because maybe they have Crohn's disease or some type of a digestive issue. And so those people, they don't absorb bile and then the bile goes into the colon and it acts as a laxative and then that creates diarrhea, bile diarrhea. And that's um, a pretty urgent, often kind of yellow burning type of diarrhea. So then the food goes into the colon and in the colon is where you know, most of the bacteria are. Um, and this is where also most of the butyrate is made. So the butyrate is made by the fiber um, and basically the prebiotics, which is largely the fiber being in the colon um, from the food that you're eating. And then the bacteria eat that fiber and they create butyrate, which is a key, it's a short chain fatty acid. And so then the butyrate and, you know, builds up and that will help keep the colon nice and healthy. Um, but it'll also help feed the brain. So um, there is definitely, you know, that brain gut connection because the brain really controls the peristalsis and the opening and the closing of the sphincters. But, um, you know, the gut also largely controls the health of the brain through um, really being a gatekeeper for inflammation and for infections and absorbing nutrients and, you know, creating all the things that the brain needs. So they have this symbiotic relationship. And so one can't really, you know, just say you need to address the gut issues when often there's a underlying neurological issue that needs to be addressed too that might be creating a lot of these issues. So for example, the, um, well, I'll talk more about that in the next slide, but um, one thing I did want to mention is that 90% of the nutrients that absorbed are largely absorbed in the first part first 100 to 150 centimeters of the small intestine. So if somebody is missing part of that from surgery, bypass, whatever, then or has issues with the health of the duodenum and jejunum, then they're going to have a lot of issues with nutrient um, deficiencies, which often don't get diagnosed properly. So, um, so if we look at the sphincters, the sphincters are all controlled by our autonomic nervous system, which is our um, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And so again, digestion is controlled by the brain. We cannot leave that out of the equation, but also our brain health is largely governed by our gut health. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Now, all of the sphincters, the lower esophageal sphincter, which allows food to uh, stay in the stomach and not go back up into the esophagus um, or come down from the esophagus into the stomach, because it can be a problem where some people, their food gets stuck in their esophagus because the sphincter is not opening. And then for other people, the sphincter is not closing. Um, and then we have the pyloric sphincter, which is um, where the stomach the food in the stomach goes from the stomach down into the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum. And so this closes when the food needs to be uh, digested by the acid, and then it opens when that food's ready to go down at the, into the duodenum. 
Um, now, and then you have the ileocecal valve. So the ileocecal valve is where this is the sphincter that basically closes off the small intestine from the large intestine. And um, what controls these sphincters is the autonomic nervous system. And what opens them is the parasympathetic nervous system. That's your rest and digest. What creates the uh, sustained closing of them is your sympathetic nervous system. So for example, if one is stressed out and they're not making enough stomach acid, then um, that is actually going to also inhibit the ability to open up this pyloric sphincter because the acidity in the stomach actually affects the ability for that sphincter to open. Simultaneously, um, if one is stressed out and this sphincter, the sphincters are not closed or not um, they're not closing like they should because that's really what keeps these sphincters closed. Um, then you're going to have issues with food going through there too fast. But what, what usually happens in most people is those sphincters are not opening up like they should because people are so stressed out. So for example, if you're don't have enough rest and digest nervous system, then your ileocecal valve will not open like it should. And then you will basically get constipated. And then basically what's going to happen is you're going to get more issues with small intestinal bowel overgrowth, often because this valve is not closing like or opening like it should, and you get more constipation. Um, or you could get small intestinal bowel overgrowth, which is a serious dysbiotic issue because you don't have enough stomach acid to kill off bad bacteria um, and bacteria before they get into your small intestine. So, um, and then if you're really stressed out, then this pyloric sphincter is not going to open. And then you're just going to end up with it kind of food petrifying in your stomach. So we have to look at, you know, not just the gut, but the brain because they are go hand in hand. And the microbiome is a huge part of that, as we're going to talk about in a minute. So, but basically, this is just an image of the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. So parasympathetic is your rest and digest. Sympathetic is your uh, fight or flight. And they both play a role in your digestion. If you don't have enough parasympathetic nervous system, then you're going to end up with less peristalsis of your digestive tract, more constipation. The sphincters are not going to be opening like they should. You're not going to be making enough stomach acid. You're not going to be um, releasing the, you're not going to be releasing the bile that you need, um, it's going to create a lot of issues. So um, versus if you have too much sympathetic, you're going to have less stomach acid, um, you're going to have less peristalsis. So our digestion um, is very much uh, controlled by our nervous system. And we can't forget that. Otherwise, we're just treating symptoms and not addressing the underlying cause. So um, if we're going to be looking at, you know, hypochlorhydria, which is a huge cause of dysbiosis, then um, there's some really good research, research out there that is basically saying that the conclusion is low stomach acid um, is a contributing factor for duodenal dysbiosis, potentially leading to the development of pathological conditions of the gastrointestinal tract. So that's basically what I just said. Low stomach acid from stress often or medications like PPIs, uh, proton pump inhibitors, acid reducers, those are going to create more of a dysbiotic bad bacteria in your digestive tract, in your intestines. And so stress will create low hydrochloric acid, but also lowering that hydrochloric acid naturally uh, or not naturally, um, artificially through, you know, prescriptions and drugs. Um, and that will increase your risk for small intestinal bowel overgrowth, um, constipation and dysbiosis, which will create, you know, neurological problems, gastric problems, inflammation, you know, all of it. So I like this picture because it's a good visual of how 
dysbiosis, which is dysbiosis is defined as um, an unhealthy gut microbiome. Basically, you have a lot of bad bacteria in your gut versus symbiosis. So symbiosis is good. We like symbiosis. You've got some lots of good bacteria in there. They're doing their thing. You have nice, healthy intestinal villi here. Your immune system's happy. You know, you don't have too much inflammation. And then maybe there's some genetic and environmental factors, which we'll talk about, that create more dysbiosis, which is where you get more bad bacteria that's going to lead to unhealthy intestinal villi, leaky gut, and eventually more, and that'll create more inflammation more disruption of the digestive lining, which is then going to create um, leaky gut and even more bad bacteria that can kind of take over. There's not enough good bacteria. There's too much bad bacteria. There's too much inflammation. Now your immune system's really primed to go after things. This is where you start setting people up for autoimmune issues. And so you know, if somebody says, oh, I have a lot of autoimmune issues or allergies or, you know, I'm sensitive to everything, then what they're telling you is they have dysbiosis, they have leaky gut, um, and they have a lot of inflammation, whether they know it or not. So here's another visual. And what I like about this visual versus the other one is that it includes the butyrate. And this is from an article called Sodium Butyrate Supplementation Ameliorates Diabetic Inflammation in Mice. And so basically, if we look at this picture on the left, we get a nice, healthy, diverse microbiome. Healthy, you know, diversity is key. <laughs> um, but yeah, diversity is key in your gut and there's not enough diversity in the gut. So there. Um, so the uh, if with diabetes, often what happens is they will get diabetic endotoxemia, which is basically where um, maybe because of antibiotics or poor diet, um, they'll get a dysbiosis, bad bacteria with their bad LPS, which are um, lipopolysaccharides. And what will happen is those will basically create a lot of inflammation and leaky gut and then they get toxin they get toxic from the lipopolysaccharides and it creates this huge inflammatory response um, and then ultimately not only do they get leaky gut but now they have often increased neutrophils because they're inflamed from the lipopolysaccharides off the bacteria um, and they often get more infections and so um, what this is showing us is that butyrate, if you supplement with butyrate, then that can feed the good bacteria and it can simultaneously feed the good, the intestinal lining so that you're less likely to get um, the dysbiosis and the leaky gut and the immune problems. So it's a vicious cycle. When you start having issues with not having enough um, good bacteria, then not only do you not have the good bacteria, but now you're not making enough butyrate because butyrate is made largely by the good bacteria in your gut. They eat the probi they eat the prebiotics. So like the probiotics, which is the good bacteria, will eat the prebiotics which is like the fiber and the oligosaccharides and the polyphenols and all that, you know, if you eat a healthy diet, you're feeding good bacteria and they're going to make butyrate. If you eat an unhealthy diet, lots of carbs, and whatnot, you're going to be feeding the unhealthy bad bacteria and they're not going to make as much butyrate. And so um, what you can kind of do to help break this cycle is supplement with butyrate is what the research says. Um, so I just think that's a great um, visual of how, you know, gut microbiome affects gut health, which ultimately affects, you know, your whole health, really, and how you can kind of put in some breaking mechanisms here to put breaks on the bad stuff that's happening while you iron out the underlying cause of the whole issue, which in this case would be diabetes or antibiotics or whatever. So here's a great article that's just kind of adding more depth to what I just said. And the title of this article is Butyrate, Neuroepigenetics, and the Gut Microbiome. Can a high fiber diet improve brain health? And 
um, the answer to that question is yes, because a high fiber diet feeds good bacteria that make butyrate and that butyrate is not only really good for your gut, but it's also really good for your brain. So if you take antibiotics and you have an unhealthy gut, then you are more likely to have an unhealthy brain. And if you have an unhealthy brain, you are more likely to have an unhealthy gut. So it's a vicious cycle and you really have to address both sides. You can't just say, I'm just going to do one or the other. You have to look at the whole picture because the body, you know, the body is not interested in compartmentalizing health. You have to look at the whole thing. So as much as medicine loves to compartmentalize, it's just not the way the body works. So um, in this study, the diet and the microbiome um, were manipulated to enhance brain function. And children on a high fiber, fiber diet demonstrated better cognitive control, multitasking, working memory, and maintaining focus than children who typically ate a lower fiber diet. Why is that? because they're feeding the good bacteria and the good bacteria is making butyrate and that's good for their brain and their gut. Other studies have examined the effects of probiotics that would increase butyrate producing bacteria. These studies showed that probiotics reduced anxiety in rats and lowered psychological stress in humans. We kind of have an epidemic of anxiety and stress. And so if you know probiotics have been shown to reduce that, and that's certainly something worth considering um, because not only are you then helping one's gut, but also their brain. Perhaps one of the most interesting brain microbiome connections lies in autism, where an overwhelming 70% of autistic children suffer from gastrointestinal symptoms. The degree of GI symptoms, most commonly diarrhea and bloating, is often positively correlated with the severity of autism. So lots of kids with autism have gut problems. And again, brain problems create gut problems. Gut problems create brain problems. If it's a vicious cycle, of course, they're going to have gut problems. But the degree of GI symptoms the, is positively correlated with the severity of the autism. So the worse the GI tract is, the worse the brain. And you can't just say, I'm just going to do brain work or gut work. You've got to look at the whole picture in these people. And the studies have found evidence of decreased bifidobacteria and prevotella and higher levels of lactobacillus, um, suturella, and formicus based in cultures from feed book samples. So bifidobacteria is largely what's making this good butyrate. And so that correlates with the butyrate um, information we've learned so far. Um, some studies have even reported an alleviation of autism symptoms in children with late onset autism with the use of vancomycin, a poorly absorbed antibiotic through the effects quickly diminished, although the effects quickly diminished after treatment ended. So that's kind of mind blowing if you think about it. Late onset autism. So of course, you know, these kids, their brains are not um, affected as early, which means that they're probably going to be the ones that are more likely to see um, a change with antibiotics simply because their their brain's not quite as damaged. Um, their right brain's not quite as damaged, which is what autism is. Um, so because it's late onset, their right brain was able to develop within the first three years of life, um, which is really um, the most important time for your right brain development. So then they give these kids, they give these people with late onset autism, vancomycin, and they get better. And then they get worse because they didn't fix the problem. They didn't fix the gut microbiome. They didn't change the diet. They didn't replace the bad bacteria with good bacteria. They just got rid of a really nasty bacteria that was messing up their health, but they didn't fix the underlying problems. But that that's a wonderful window into how the gut brain connection really, you know, is affected. They didn't fix the brain. <laughs> they didn't fix the brain. You've got to also fix the brain so that you can get the gut to work properly also because the immune system is controlled by the brain 
and the gut is controlled by the brain. So what this says is butyrate can protect the brain and enhance plasticity in neurological disease models. Gut microbiome pr produce butyrate by fermenting carbohydrates in a high fiber diet. And a high fiber diet can elevate butyrate and prevent slash treat brain disorders. Interesting stuff. This image is from the article I just quoted. And I think it's just a great visual of how butyrate can affect so many different diseases. And it's because it's affecting not just the gut, but the brain also really likes butyrate too. Uh, here's an article about how antibiotics can cause depression. Um, so if one is taking antibiotics, then they certainly need to be taking probiotics during and after. Saccharomyces boulardii during and some really high quality uh, probiotics and prebiotics during and after to help to protect the brain, not just the gut, but also the brain, and to help um, reduce the risk of things like C. diff. So recurrent antibiotic exposure is associated with an increased risk for de depression and, and, and anxiety, but not psychosis is what this said. So I think it's probably also associated with psychosis, but a little bit more complicated there. They probably just, you know, weren't weeding out the factors. All right, here's one more article worth looking at. Link between antibiotics and mental illness. Yes. Um, people with serious mental disorders who are, were hospitalized for mania were more likely to be on antibiotics to treat active infections than a group of people without a mental disorder. <laughs> this is really, it's really amazing if you think about it, you know, why are, why are mental health, you know, doctors and facilities not really looking at the gut? Why are, um, why is the gut often afterthought? Why, um, why do we compartmentalize gastroenterology versus neurology? Um, so that this often, this article also says their findings add to evidence that the body's immune system and the so-called gut brain axis and the particular bacterial microbiome, each person has play play an integral part in the ebb and flow of psychiatric symptoms and psychiatric disorders, including bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. So, you know, maybe the first line of defense needs to really be, let's get, let's, let's fix the gut, you know, rather than let's, you know, give you a bunch of antipsychotics or whatever. Um, one could ask that question. Maybe that needs to be a part of it. Um, I'm going to talk more about type 1 diabetes in a later lecture about autoimmune diseases, because type 1 diabetes, you know, is an autoimmune disease. But if you're going to look at the, you know, the gut microbiome and epigenetics and genetics, and we're going to talk about genes in a minute, but um, it's not just about the genes that we inherit. There are genes that set us up for digestive issues um, and autoimmune diseases, but we also inherit the a microbiome from our parents. And we inherit that really the day we're born through vaginal delivery. So this is one reason that vaginal delivery babies are less likely to have autoimmune diseases, especially type 1 diabetes. We inherit it through breast milk and the good bacteria and the oligosaccharides, the, the prebiotics in breast milk. We inherit it um, through just, you know, touch, kiss, um, not washing our hands very well, and, you know, poop, pooping on babies when they're born, like almost every animal poops on their child when they're born, whether, you know, they mean to or not, it just, it's part of it. Um, but so we can't live in a sterile environment and be healthy. And so what we know is that children that are born C-section, given a lot of antibiotics, not breastfed, um, overly hygiene, they are more likely to have autoimmune diseases. And we are set up for, you know, what I am calling the autoimmune generation, which is basically my child's generation. Um, it's getting worse with every generation, but with, you know, the correct environmental factors that we've seen over the last couple of years, the autoimmune generation is really taking hold and we're going to see things we've never seen before. And we already are. Um, and so, uh, it's so important that 
we look at the gut piece, not just in the child, but in the mom. And there's some really cool things I'm going to tell you about in a minute about, you know, genes we can look at that can really help us figure out how to really make precise decisions for um, infants and their health. So, uh, so we're going to talk about the FUT2 gene. And this gene encodes for um, fucosal transferase which is an enzyme that controls whether oligosaccharides are expressed in just the bodily fluid. Um, so if it's just, if it's, it's, if it's just in your blood, those people are called non-secretors. They're not secreting it outside of their blood. Basically this is like your gene, you know, your um, blood type, like a bud blood type B, A, B, O. So we, we secrete that in our blood, everybody does that. But some people based on this gene will secrete it just in their blood, whereas other people based on their genes will secrete it in their blood plus other bodily fluids. And the people who secrete it only in their blood are non-secretors, they have the genotype for non-secretors. And the people who secrete it in their bod other body bodily fluids are secretors. And so what are those other bodily fluids and why do we care about them? Because one of those bodily fluids is the intestinal mucosa, which we're going to talk about how important this gene is for um, digestive disorders and autoimmune diseases and infections because of some people that are secretors and their intestinal mucosa having this versus other people that don't have this in their intestinal mucosa. Um, so if you secrete these, in your intestinal mucosa, it'll affect the bacteria in your gut. If you secrete these in your sweat, it can affect the bacteria on your skin. If you secrete these in the saliva, it'll affect the bacteria in your mouth. If you secrete these in your vaginal mucosa, it'll affect the bacteria in your vaginal flora. Same with the semen and same with breast milk. And so we're going to talk more about that. But basically this gene, there's some good research that it plays a role in intestinal health by um, increasing the number of intestinal binding sites available for bacteria. And it also plays a role in B12, which I'm going to explain that more in a second. So I'm going to start with this image, which I think is a nice visual for kind of setting the stage. Uh, I've just told you what FUT2 does. Now I'm going to show you what it does. And what it does is if you're a, if you're a non-secretor, then you're not going to have these little oligosaccharides um, for bacteria to attach onto. So you see the non the secretors are down here at the bottom and they have these little oligosaccharides, the little um, orange and the red things. And basically, um, the bacteria can attach to those little red things. Um, and in some cases, it can be bad bacteria. In some cases, it can be good bacteria. But basically, if you're a secretor, you're giving these bacteria an option to latch on. And whether they're good or bad, they, they now have a way to latch on. Versus a non-secretor, you're, you're not secreting the oligosaccharides that allow them to bind on so they don't bite on, bind on. So what that means is as far as genetics go, and if we're really going to get into the details of this, which we are, we are going to look at these genes. We are going to learn about some key genes and we're going to really understand them. Um, and we're going to understand what they mean. And we're going to take actions to help people to, you know, identify and prevent, um, genetic landmines. And so when it comes to FUT2 genes, there are a lot that people like to talk about. I like to, I, I'm, I'm developing more of a, let's just focus on a couple and learn a lot about them approach. Um, and so that's my approach with you today. I've isolated two of what I believe to be the most important based on the research. Of these two, the bottom one is, I would say, the most important. Um, which maybe you can judge by the amount of writing that I put. But basically, you have these two SNPs, genetic SNPs. They have uh, different RS numbers, which you can identify them by, or you can identify them by their name, and then the genotypes and what this means. So if you have a non-secretor genotype, then you know if you have this TT genotype for 
FUTA12404 T with RS number 1047781. TT genotype, non secretor. TA, slight secretor, not secreting as much as the AA. AA, full on secretor for this genotype. We go down to the bottom genotype, FUT2G12447A, RS60133A. If we have two A, if we're AA, non secretor, we're not secreting. AG, we're, we're partly secreting, a little bit, not all the way, but a little bit. GG, we're secreting, okay? So let's let's look closely at this bottom one, FUT G12447A, because I think if you can really get this and understand this, then you kind of, you can really get, get it. So the non-secretors, these people are not secreting the, like the AB gene, uh, oligosaccharides, people with AA, they're not secreting and they are, um, so they're not secreting into their bodily fluids to express on the mucosal surface. It's still in the blood. And they're, these people, they have a decreased risk of diarrheal illnesses and childhood ear infections and an increased risk for celiac disease. Um, and this is largely a result of the fact that there are certain bacteria that they are more likely to have problems with and there's certain bacteria that they are less likely to have problems with. So the biggest difference is people that are secretors are more likely to get infected with the norovirus, rotavirus, H. pylori when they, when, if they're secretors because they're secreting those um, oligosaccharides that the bacteria, these bacteria, norovirus, rotavirus, and H. pylori want to bind to. However, they are also secreting um, the peptides that bifidobacteria are going to bind to. Bifidobacteria are good. So it's not like it's a zero-sum game. It's not like it's good or bad. It's just they're more likely to bind to stuff. What they're binding to depends on what's in your gut and depends on you know, do you have dysbiosis? Do you have symbiosis? Have you been taking antibiotics and you've got all these bad bacteria now? Or have you been taking probiotics and prebiotics and you have all these good bacteria? Do you have a healthy brain that's really promoting good peristalsis so that you can have good, good symbiosis? Or do you have an unhealthy brain that's promoting, you know, constipation and inflammation and where you have an unhealthy brain? Okay, so... If we compare this to the AA non-secretors, these people are going to have lower levels of good bacteria, bifidobacteria, because they don't have anything for the intestinal lining to attach them to. Um, and they're at an increased risk for candida. And they're at an increased risk for flu and meningitis. Um, but they are, and, and, and mumps and streptococcus pneumonia, but they are at a decreased risk for norovirus, rotavirus, and H. pylori. So it's like I said, you know, either way, there are risks. You just have to know how to monitor and moderate these risks. So the decreased risk for some bacterial infection um, is largely because they're not secreting. And then the increased risk for other ones is because they're not secreting. Now, this genotype, the non-secretors, they're more likely to have type 1 diabetes, psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease, and Crohn's disease. Um, and um, celiac as well. And so basically, you're looking at a situation here where people that have, you know, this genetic type, they're more likely to have a certain genetic or uh, a certain gut microbiome uh, situation and that specific microbiome which is being created by their genes and whether the secretors or not is influencing whether they're turning on these autoimmune genes or not and it appears as though the non-secretors are more likely to have um, autoimmune diseases having said that there's plenty of people that are secretors that have autoimmune diseases. So it's not, it's not as easy, you know, it, this is just another tool in your toolbox, another thing to learn about and consider and look at. Um, now, B12, the people who are secretors 
tend to have lower levels of B12. And that is largely because they are more likely to get H. pylori and H. pylori destroys the ability for your pyloric cells to make intrinsic factor. And then they get very low in B12 versus the non-secretors, which are less likely to be low in B12 because they do not get the H. pylori as easily, which makes them less likely to be low in B12. Having said that, there are plenty of non-secretors out there that are low in B12, maybe because they have Crohn's disease or some other digestive disease, or maybe they're just, you know, vegan or vegetarian, they're not eating enough. There's lots of people out there that are low in B12. So it's not like you don't, you only look at B12 levels in one group and not the other. Of course, we look at that in everybody. But I just want, I like to, I like to understand the really the understanding of why something's happening, because if I can understand why, then I can really, you know, um, do so much more with it than just, you know, memorizing a fact. So um, why does all this matter? Because not only do, you know, the non-secretors not secrete um, in their digestive system, um, intestinal mucosa, in their vaginal flora um, skin, but also in breast milk, they're not secreting those oligosaccharides, which means that they're babies are not getting basically like the prebiotics to feed the good bacteria. And then their babies are more likely to have gut dysbiosis, bad gut microbiome, increased risk of type 1 diabetes, autoimmune diseases, celiac, Crohn's, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, anybody that's a non-secretor, certainly needs to look really close at the fact that they are more likely to have a child that's a non-secretor as well, especially, you know, if depending on their spouse's genotype, their partner's genotype. Um, and so basically um, with these parents and children, they need to really consider early interventions with good bacteria, but also with those good prebiotics as well, the oligosaccharides. And when I say early, I'm talking about like day one. In the autoimmune um, and celiac course that I'm going to be teaching in the future um, with you guys, I'll go into more research as far as the, the type 1 diabetes and the autoimmune connection and, and really that first 28 days of life and what gut flora means for the rest of your life during that first 28 days. But today I just want you to understand that if somebody is a non-secretor, and in many cases, even if they are secretors, you still need to look closely at making sure that these parents and children have plenty of good bacteria. Mom needs to be taking bacteria, infant needs to be taking bacteria, and prebiotics, especially with the non-secretors because and they have to be eating a lot of fiber-rich foods in their diet. Um, of course, you can't give a baby a ton of fiber, uh, especially an infant, um, newborn. But you can give them those oligosaccharides, which might be much more important if they're non-secretors. Now, I mentioned the B12 piece, and I just wanted to show you a picture to kind of drive home what I've been trying to drive home, which a lot of people I think need to understand, which is the parietal cells, which are the acid producing cells, they make that intrinsic factor, which then binds to B12. And then that travels down all the way to the ileum where it's absorbed. Now, if you're a secretor, you're more likely to have H. pylori, which means that you're more likely to have damaged parietal cells, which means you're not going to be making intrinsic factor, which means it doesn't matter how much B12 you take, you're not going to absorb it. And that is largely why secretors are more likely to be low in B12. And if all you know is low B12 with um, secretors, not as low B12 as non-secretors, then you miss the boat. And I, I don't want anybody to miss the boat because then you miss like the whole underlying gut microbiome connection, which is what it's really all about. 
So foods that are rich in oligosaccharides, vegetables, scallions, white onions, leeks, garlic, kale, red cabbage, green cabbage, broccoli, Jerusalem artichokes, fruits, nectarines, watermelon, pears, blueberries, sour cherries, mulberries, red currants, raspberries, cantaloupes, figs, and bananas, grains, wheat and rye. Please don't eat those grains, but they are high in oligosaccharides, just full disclosure. Um, legumes, all beans, peas, and lentils. So lot, eat, eat lots of oligosaccharide-rich foods, and then um, consider some really good prebiotics just to kind of make sure you have a nice, robust food for the bacteria to thrive on. Okay, so I just want to introduce the celiac gene since I mentioned celiac disease and how, of course, you know, we're talking about the gut microbiome and we've established the fact that your gut microbiome um, can set you up for autoimmune diseases, including um, celiac disease. I wanted to introduce the celiac genes, but know that because celiac disease is an autoimmune disease, I'll be talking about that at a future autoimmune lecture really in great detail. But for the purposes of today, you know, I want you to know that these are the two celiac genes and that they're significant and that you need to be testing for them and you need to understand what they mean. Um, and that just because you have the celiac gene does not mean that you will develop celiac disease, but it does certainly increase the risk. And what I have seen is that most people with the celiac gene, they often don't realize they have a problem with gluten until they kind of realize they have the gene and they seriously consider that it might they might actually have a problem and then they try a gluten-free diet and see how they do and i'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a case study of that um and then obviously like i said we'll go into much more detail in future lectures autoimmune lectures but before we do that um i just want to talk about you know how the gut microbiome really play a role in celiac disease and whether you turn on that gene or turn it off. Because we know celiac disease is an autoimmune disease and it can affect the digestive system, although it's an autoimmune disease that can affect the entire body, including the brain, skin, you know, the whole thing. And um, so it's an autoimmune disease and it gets turned on by environmental factors. And what are environmental factors that can turn on bad genes? Well, gut microbiome is certainly one of them. It's common for people to get a viral or bacterial infection and then develop um, full on celiac or some other autoimmune disease. Um, stress can be a big trigger. Uh, foods can be a big trigger. Um, even toxins can be triggers. We're going to talk about the microbiome as far as how it plays a role in uh, celiac disease and where pro probiotics can really be therapeutic. And in this study where I got this image from, um, they were basically looking at good bacteria, probiotics, um, lactobacillus bifobacterium, and they found that they exerted protective properties on the epithelial cells from damage caused by gliadin, which is gluten. And so the probiotics help to break down the gluten peptides. Of course, if you have a problem with gluten, avoid gluten. That's what you need to do first and foremost. Um, having said that, a lot of people still get and exposures when they're not trying to and they don't mean to and they need to still be protecting their body from it and people that have that gene and are not going to go on a gluten-free diet then taking probiotics can also help protect them from turning on that gene because it's going to help break down those gluten peptides um, which is going to prevent leaky gut from happening which is going to prevent them from getting this autoimmune primed situation where their immune system's going to just go after itself because it's going after too many different things and it's lost tolerance. So we have few fewer gluten peptides. We, we don't have leaky gut because the probiotics often help to keep those tight junctions nice and um, together so that you don't get leaky gut. And if you don't get leaky gut, you're less likely to have all this inflammation. Having said that, if you do develop inflammation, then the probiotics can help to decrease that inflammation. So this is really pretty powerful. Step one, 
we're breaking down the gluten, which hopefully you're not getting, especially if you have a problem with gluten. Step two, we're keeping the tight junctions together. So that's preventing leaky gut and keeping your intestinal lining healthy, making sure you're not developing inflammation. Step three, if you do have inflammation, we're decreasing it because we're decreasing that um, TNF alpha and IFN. So that's pretty cool, really, if you think about it. Um, and we're preventing basically um, the degradation of the intestinal lumen. Now, even people that have celiac disease and they are 100% avoiding gluten, often, you know, their intestinal lining can be so damaged that it doesn't come back like it should. And they really need to be looking at gut microbiome as well so that they can get these nice, healthy intestinal villi and not lose their intestinal villi, which creates um, a lot of nutritional deficiencies and health problems because they don't have the surface area to absorb things. Now, here's an interesting... Um, you know, a lot of people will take digestive enzymes to help break down gluten. I I take them, but I don't take them as a this is this is my way to eat gluten and um, cheat. No, 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 no. I take them as a way to prevent myself from incidental exposure from eating out or et cetera, that type of thing. And um, I think they help, especially if I am traveling and eating out a lot. Um, having said that, you know, it's really important that you don't confuse using a supplement to help reduce incidental exposure from using a supplement to say, I'm going to go eat, you know, a gluten pizza and take like 10 of these because that's not going to work. That's not a good idea. Please don't do that. Having said that, you know, this research study is showing pretty clearly that these enzymes do break down and decrease the amount of gluten in the stomach and duodenum. Um, so they do work, um, which you could translate into helping with incidental exposure. And it is something worth considering. Now I have a little case study for you just to kind of summarize everything and give you a little teaser into the upcoming, uh, you know, when I do the autoimmune lecture with you guys, we'll talk more about celiac, but this guy's name is John. He's 65 years old. He's a male. And he came in, his wife wanted him to come in. And um, he has this intention tremor for 30 years. Um, no known cause. Doctors haven't really, they basically said it's benign essential tremor and don't worry about it. Um, no known gut issues. So he comes in to me, uh, comes and sees me. I, I do some testing on him. He's got uh, awful Romberg. So he's just swaying. He can't even close his eyes. Like I have to, I have to like stand there to catch him when he closes his eyes. Um, and we can't even do the middle Myers marching test because he's just, he can't close his eyes. And then um, he has an intention tremor. So what is an intention tremor? So an intention tremor is where like you have the tremor when you're trying to do something. So like have him stand there and all right, touch your nose and you should be able just to touch your nose. But if you have an intention tremor, it's like, I can't touch my nose because I have an intention tremor because I'm trying, I'm intending to do something and I have a tremor. Whereas an, a resting tremor, I have a tremor, but then when I go to touch my nose, the tremor goes away. But when I'm resting, I have a tremor. I'm resting as I have a tremor. That's Parkinson's resting tremor. Now, the intention tremor is a cerebellar issue. Cerebellar tr tr uh, tremors are intention tremors. So cerebellar tremors would be no tremor. I go to touch my nose. I can't do it without a tremor. Parkinson's tremor, usually they start on the right side because it's often a left brain issue. Parkinson's tremor, uh, they're resting with a tremor. And then when they start doing something, the tremor gets better. So it's good to know the difference. So cerebellar issues, cerebellum has to do with balance, you know, important part of your nervous system. Um, gluten, and I'll talk more about this later, but gluten um, likes to attack the cerebellum. Um, it, there's a molecular mimicry there where, um, when you have autoimmune disease, it's not gluten attacking the cerebellum. It's gluten looks enough like your cerebellum that when one develops autoimmune diseases, like celiac disease, especially they will develop 
a autoimmune reaction to their glute, to their cerebellum, and it will destroy their cerebellum. And that will cause them to have balance issues, intention tremors, neurological issues. It's not good, folks. Okay, so he comes in. He has these labs he brought from his doctor's office. You know, he just just got them hot off the press. And as you see here, you know, his neutrophils are like really high um, and his lymphocytes are really low. He's got um, some thyroid issues. Doctor didn't say anything about it, but he does. Uh, his testosterone is not amazing. Hemoglobin hematocrit, some funky issues going on there. But the neutrophils and the lymphocytes are just... This is nasty, folks. This is there, there's something bad happening. Of course, his doctor didn't say anything about it, but it's not pretty. Now I know what some of you are thinking because I have been paying attention, and a lot of you are thinking, "Oh, he has a bacterial infection. This is a bacterial infection." Um, and it is true that when one has a bacterial infection, they can get high neutrophils because of the bacterial infection. But he, this man does not have a bacterial infection. And I will, I'll, I'll show you what the problem is in a minute. Um, but let me go through the rest of these labs. So um, his cholesterol and triglycerides, he's got low LDL cholesterol. And then he's got high triglycerides, really high triglycerides. This is not pretty stuff. And he's got a number of genetic issues that, um, you know, are relevant. The most relevant and the reason I'm talking about him today is because after doing this, um, after seeing these labs, I ordered a couple other things. So uh, we got these labs ordered a couple days later, and um, turns out his ferritin's really, really high. Uh, he's got lots of inflammation, and his C-reactive protein's really high. He's got a 16 C-reactive protein. Um, his B12's not great. His folate's not great. Um Thankfully, he has a really low lipoprotein A, which is interesting because he also had a zero on his calcium score test, which is um, just indicative of a low lipoprotein A. Um, your analysis, let's see, your analysis was pretty good. Um, okay, so I did a number of things after this, you know, to help him as far as the ferritin the uh, homocysteine, the C-reactive protein. Where is the homocysteine and the C-reactive protein? I ordered those. Yeah, the homocysteine was 12.5, the C-reactive protein. Okay, so doing lots of things to help decrease inflammation. It's clear he has an inflammation problem, but I'm really waiting on genes here. I need to get genes. Not too long after this, because I want to know if he has a hemochromatosis gene. I'm like, why is your ferritin so high with your iron saturation like that? I don't know. I'm not going to talk about hemochromatosis today. He's not a hemochromatosis person. He does not have that gene. It's a totally different issue for him. I don't have time to talk about that. He does have the celiac gene. So we get the celiac gene back and I'm like, huh, maybe that's why your neutrophils were so high. Maybe that was an autoimmune thing. Maybe that's why your C-reactive protein is so high. Okay. Um... So he goes on a gluten-free diet. We recheck labs a couple months later. And um, his red blood cells, hemoglobin, hematocrit, they're not getting better. That's because his testosterone's gotten so much higher. Um, his uh, glucose is high. B12's come up. His, it's really the... What, this is really what I wanted to show you. Look at those neutrophils and lymphocytes. The neutrophils are 58 and the lymphocytes are 27. And that is because he got on a gluten-free diet. There was no, no bacterial thing treated. It wasn't bacterial. This was an autoimmune T2 driven response. Got off of gluten. Not only did his labs get better, the trimmer he had for 30 years went away. His balance, much, much better, much better, significantly better, amazingly better. Now he can do the middle mile marching test. He can do the Rombergs. He's not going all over the place for swing. Um, I wish I had videos for you. Um, also in these labs, ferritin drops. Um, 
he didn't go remove blood or anything, um, but his ferritin drops uh, largely because just everything we were doing. But the ferritin was 564 and it came down. His inflammation's much lower. And part of that could be because he's on a gluten-free diet, probably some other pieces too. Homocysteine comes down because he was taking some homocysteine lowering stuff. Vitamin D is way too high. So he gets on a lower dose of vitamin D3, K2 there. And then this is interesting. And I want to point out his cholesterol goes up. Hmm. And it's not just the good cholesterol, which did go up. It's his total cholesterol and LDL. LDL went up to 114. It was not that high before. It was 89 before. Um, his triglycerides, however, drop. They were 233 and now they are at 99. That's really good. This is good. This means that his liver is healing up, much less likely to have fatty liver. This is, good things are happening. Why did the cholesterol go up? Well, I'll tell you my theory. Sometimes when you see these people that have a problem with gluten and they don't have any known digestive issues, they do actually have digestive issues they're not aware of. And those digestive issues might not create pain or diarrhea or constipation, but it can just be that the villi of their small intestine are getting destroyed and they're not absorbing things as well as they should. And then when they get on a gluten-free diet, sometimes their labs will get worse. You'll see this also with people if they are taking a proton pump inhibitor, like an acid reducer, and they get off of it. Um, or if like they have low bile and like, you know, you get their bile, their bile comes up and, you know, oftentimes when people are getting healthier, meaning, you know, their digestive system is healthier, their cholesterol will go up because they're absorbing cholesterol better. And it's something that you have to be able to both predict and explain because these people are working really hard to get better and, you know, they're spending a lot of time and money and they're, they're committed often. And so if they see their labs get worse and there's not a good reason for it, then that can sometimes be discouraging. But if you have a good reason and you can explain it to them, then that can often really help to bridge that gap and say, okay, we just, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. We just need to, you know, keep, keep going, keep working. Okay. So that's that's that case study, and um, that's really all I have for you guys. So thank you for your time, and please um, stay in touch through you know TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all that junk. And here's my book, Genetic Testing: Defining Your Path to a Personalized Health Plan. I have another book coming out soon called The Iron Curse, which I'm very excited about. So please, um, you know, uh, check that out too. That should be out shortly. And Thank you so much for your time. I hope that you learned some good things and can help some people. And, you know, let's make the world healthier and happier and all that. Thanks. Bye.